A lot of people have asked me to create a video that shows how I set up and use the D850 for birds, birds in flight, wildlife, pretty much any fast moving subjects. So that's what this video is all about. And I know not everybody wants to watch a video, so I've taken the entire contents of this video and made it into an ebook that you can get in the description below. A lot of people have also asked how they could help support me, the videos, the channel, and all the stuff I do. Purchasing that ebook is an excellent way to do that. It's only five bucks, and plus you get the book. You can take it with you wherever you go on your phone, your iPad, your Kindle, your Android. It's a downloadable PDF, so you can have it with you wherever you are. And again, there's a link to that in the description below. The D850 is a great camera. It doesn't really need an introduction, and I think that's something that everybody can agree on. But getting the most out of the camera can be a little bit tricky. Um, this is in no way a complete guide. It's really a guide designed for bird photography, bird in flight, wildlife, or anything fast moving. It's not the right way. I'm not saying it's the wrong way. This is how I've used the camera to get some extraordinary results, and I'm more than happy to share these settings with you today. Just remember that the D850 is an extremely precise, high resolution camera and it can take a little getting used to. This camera will become your greatest critic. It will expose every single mistake you make and it's wonderful high resolution glory. It has no problems pointing out mistakes in your technique, pointing out mistakes in your exposure settings. And while this sounds like a bad thing, it's actually really, really beneficial because the D850 can teach you to be a better photographer. The D850 really shines when you can slap a really high quality piece of glass to the front, preferably a prime lens. I've had the pleasure of shooting the D850 on some of the really big exotic primes and the images that they capture with the D850 are just absolutely incredible. There's no comparing them. If you don't have a prime lens and you use something like the Nikkor 200-500, which I love, shoot everything in the middle of the frame because that's where these lenses are the sharpest. As you start to move out from the center, they'll get soft and they might even exhibit some other problems that you don't want to see in your images. So I prefer if I'm using this to shoot everything right in the middle and then crop and post. That's how I get the sharpest images with something that's not a prime lens. There are also a few accessories I highly suggest. The grip, the extra capacity battery, and the door. They're must have in my opinion. And I know a lot of people have voiced Really strong opinions on these being overpriced. They are expensive, but I can tell you that this is one instance where the juice is worth the squeeze. In other words, the cost of these is well worth the added benefit that you get. So you get an extra two frames per second that boosts it up to nine frames, which doesn't sound like that much, but I've noticed a big increase in the actual autofocus performance with the battery and the grip. I don't really have any scientific evidence to back this up. I just know that as soon as I started using the grip, my keeper rate went through the roof. I also suggest you purchase and use a high capacity XQD card. This is a very fast card that can keep up with the fast nine frames per second. I also suggest you have a decent SD card. I use mine as overflow and for video. So if my XQD card fills up, all of the images will automatically be written to the SD card and I'll show you how to set that up in this setup video. All right, the first thing we're gonna do is set up the default metering mode for the D850. Now, if you don't know what a metering mode is, it's actually a light meter inside the camera that measures the light in the entire scene and tells you how to adjust your exposure accordingly. I like to use matrix metering as my default metering and it kind of measures the entire scene as an average and tells you to adjust your exposure according to that. It doesn't work in every situation and I'll show you how to set up an alternate metering mode a little bit later in this video to another button for times when it doesn't work. So let's set that up now. All right, the first thing you need to do is actually turn the camera on. Whoop. And you get all of the information you need about the camera in this nice little screen here, but there's a better way to get all this information. So this info button will turn on the back screen and give you all of that information on the back screen. Everything that you could need to know about your camera pretty much is right here. And it's really easy to see, much easier to see than that small window up top. So to change the metering mode, you have to press in this weird looking button on the top. And if you have the back screen on while you press this button, it'll show you your current metering mode and how you can adjust it. It's telling you that you need to, in order to change it, you need to turn this dial which is located 
right up here in this rear dial. And by turning that dial, it will change all of the various meter modes. It'll cycle through them. And this icon is the icon for matrix metering. And that's what we want. All right, so let's set up the primary focus mode for the D850. And the D850, like many other Nikon cameras, has two focus modes. It has AFS, which stands for autofocus single area, and AFC, which stands for autofocus continuous area. Now, like AFS is good for still stuff like landscapes, but because we're doing fast moving stuff like birds and other wildlife, we want AFC or AF continuous. So in order to set up our primary focus mode, there's a button on the side of the camera right here and it's got a little toggle switch and this toggle switch actually changes from manual to autofocus. The M is manual, the AF is auto and that's what we want. Now in order to set or change our primary focus mode, in the middle of this toggle switch is a button. It's kind of hard to see and I've met a few people that, that had a hard time finding this but right here in the middle is this little button. So you have to press and hold this button in order to change the actual focus mode. And I'm going to come around to the back of the camera. I'm going to turn on info again so I can see what I'm doing. And then I'm going to press in this little button that was on the side of the focus selector here. And you'll see it says now focus mode AF area mode. And we want the focus mode to say AFC. And you change that with this back dial. And you can only do two choices, AFS, or AFC. We want AFC. And while we're here, we're going to set up our primary actual focus area. And I like to have single point as my primary, even though it's not going to be my primary. And there's a reason for that, because when I'm looking through the viewfinder and I'm not pressing any buttons at all, I like to have a, a clear, unobstructed view of what I'm doing. And with single point, you only see one tiny little square in the middle. So I like to set that as my default, even though it's not going to be my default. And I'll explain that a little bit later. So in order to set that, again, you have to press this info button to get the back screen on and then hold in the button that was on the side here by the focus modes. And this is saying the front dial changes the actual focus area. And the front dial is located directly under the power button and the shutter activation button. It's this dial right here. So turning that dial will then cycle through all of the available areas. So I'm turning it now and I want it to be single point, which is that one right there. That's what I want. All right. So before we get too deep into setting this thing up, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Nikon menu system just to make sure everybody is on the same page with me here. So I find the uh, Nikon menu system extremely intuitive. It's pretty easy for me to understand. And to access it, you press this little menu button right here on the back of the camera. Boop. It's right there. And then the actual menu system will come on. And you can navigate this menu in many different ways. You can use this multi-selector button on the side and move throughout the menu. And what's important to note is everything here on the left would be considered like your main menu selections and then everything here would be considered like a sub or child menu of whatever main menu you're in. So right now I'm in the playback menu and it's highlighted in yellow to let me know that's where I am and all of these are options that are within the playback menu. And I mentioned how you can use this button to navigate through all of this menu system but you know that's, that's kind of old school. Uh, the cool thing, or one of the cool things about the D850 is it's touch screen. So you can touch the entire screen to move back and forth through the menu systems. That's really cool. So you can just go back and forth this way. And it's much faster than using this over here. So something to take note of is if you get kind of deep into the menu system, there's this handy back arrow that will take you backwards, at least one place into the menu. So remember that at all times. And then as another fail safe, if you're in the menu and you're lost and you think you might have done something and you don't want to save it, touch the shutter release button. Just barely touch it, not full, half touch, and it will exit the menu and shut it off. It's kind of like a, a cool little fail safe. Like if you're like, oh man, I don't know if I want to save all this, just half press the shutter button and the whole menu system will shut off. So the first thing we're going to change is a value in the playback menu. And I know I'm in the playback menu because this little play symbol 
is highlighted. And I want the playback display options. I want to change something here. So all I have to do is touch that. And now I'm in that menu and this is exactly what I want. I want focus points activated on my pictures and I'll explain why and show you how it works in just a second. So I've selected that and I have to hit OK to save it. And now that's been saved into the menu. So by activating that focus point option, I can see exactly where the focus point was on the image I took. And in this case, it was right on this bird's face and that's what I want. And now why would I want to do this? Well, for a few reasons. If I get a picture that's not in focus and I look on the back of the camera and I see the, the focus point was not on my subject, then I know I messed up and I need to practice a little bit at keeping my focus point on that subject. If I get a picture that isn't in focus and the focus point is on my subject, then either the camera misfocused or I had like a shutter or a shutter speed or an aperture setting wrong. So it's kind of a troubleshooting learning tool to be able to see where the focus points are and it will help, or at least it's helped me, it's helped me be able to keep those focus points on my subject at all times and just being able to review them on the back of the screen like that is super, super helpful for me. All right, so while we're on the subject of viewing your images on the back screen, I wanted to show you a couple of cool tips for viewing them up close and navigating them a little bit easier. So once they're on, suppose you wanted to see a close-up version of, say over here on this side of the screen, you just double tap where you wanted and it will automatically zoom into that portion of the screen and then you can just use your finger to move the whole image around. And as you can see, look, there's a couple of baby great blue herons and then a silly looking parent. And if you wanted to zoom back out, you just double tap the screen anywhere. So to zoom in, like on a specific point, double tap the screen, it'll automatically zoom in. And then take note of these arrows that show up at the bottom. That allows you to go from, you know, cycle through all of the images that you have taken really fast. And if you wanted to zoom back out or run back in, and then you can, you know, you can pinch and zoom all the way in, all the way out. You can, you can actually navigate the images themselves themselves by just flicking the screen. It's really, really powerful. But suppose you wanted to see right where this focus point was. You simply touch this button here in the middle of the multi-selector and it will automatically zoom in right on the focus point so you can really quickly check focus to make sure that you nailed it. And to zoom back out, you just touch that button one more time. Really cool stuff. So I'm gonna jump back into the playback menu because there's one other setting I want to change. So in case your screen had shut off, you just press the menu button to turn it back on. I want to change this image, image review to off. So what happens here is when, if it was on, as soon as you take a picture, the image will show up on the back of the screen. And for me, that's unnecessary. It uh, wastes the battery because it's constantly trying to display the images. And believe it or not, it actually also slows the buffer down by trying to display all these images. So I just turn that off and you can simply do that by touching image review and then off and you're done. So, all right, let's make some changes to another section of the menu. It's actually the photo shooting menu, and it says so right here on the top. And you know you're there because this little camera icon has been activated. So the first thing that I want to change here is my primary slot selection. So you just touch that. I want my primary slot to be that XQD card because that's where I want all of the images to go. So you choose that XQD card. And then the next thing I'm going to change is the secondary slot function. So you just touch that and then you touch overflow. And what that does is suppose you're out there and you've kind of just lost in the moment and you're taking a picture of a big beautiful eagle or a snowy owl if you live up north as it's flying by and you forgot that you only had two images left on your XQD card. Instead of the camera stopping, that overflow will then go to the SD card. So you actually won't lose the moment. It's actually very, very helpful. So I'm going to make another change within this menu. And you can actually navigate or scroll up or down in two ways. You can touch the screen and flick it, or you can use this multi-selector. I like the multi-selector in this instance because sometimes touching the screen activates the menu. So I'm going to scroll down until I get to image quality and I shoot in raw so I'm going to touch raw and I have now chosen raw as my image quality so raw images you need an external uh, image editing software to sort of develop them if you're not comfortable shooting raw then 
you can change it to like JPEG fine and that's the highest quality JPEG that this camera will take and it actually does really well with those but I like to shoot the raw files so I select raw and then the next thing is the actual resolution of the D850 and you get that here with image size so I'm going to touch image size and I'm going to touch the NEF raw and this is what I want I want raw large 82 56 by 5504 45.4 megabytes that's taking full advantage of the high resolution sensor in this beast of a camera that's why I bought it so I'm gonna use that setting so I'm still in the photo shooting menu I'm gonna go to the NEF raw recording and then I'm gonna touch this NEF raw compression and I choose lossless compressed so what that's doing is that's actually making the raw files a little bit smaller by compressing them but it's lossless so there's no data loss so it's actually you know almost makes no sense not to use that format so while I'm still here I need to go back to the same area again so I'm going to touch the NEF raw recording and now I'm going to adjust the NEF raw bit depth 12 bit or 14 bit 12 bit or 14 bit Ooh, what do I choose I don't know be honest with you there's a lot of people that have done a lot of tests on both of them and they say they can't see the difference I bought a high resolution camera I'm gonna choose 14 bit because it actually has more information and because every bit counts <laughs> that's a bad joke all right so now we're gonna set up auto ISO for the D850 I shoot with auto ISO I found it invaluable for um, birds and wildlife photography it's just one less thing I have to think about so with auto ISO the camera chooses the ISO based on a range I tell it is acceptable um, it could be a low range of 100 to a high range of 5000 and then the camera will choose an ISO in that range to get a good exposure there are a few times this doesn't work I found that about 75% of the situations I shoot in auto ISO is perfect 25% of the times it's not so perfect and I'll show you a way that you can quickly and easily turn it off and alter it in that 25% all right so let's turn on auto ISO and set a range I'm still in the photo shooting menu and to do this I touch the ISO sensitivity settings Boop. and now I'm in here my ISO sensitivity I'm going to touch that and I want 64 Boop. that's the lowest native ISO on the D850 it provides the cleanest most beautiful pictures with the highest dynamic range that's what I want I don't always get 64 you know because the camera chooses that based on lighting situations and it's not always there's always not enough available light to get ISO 64 but in those cases when I can it's there and ready for me so the next thing I want to do is I want to touch this auto ISO sensitivity control and I want that on and hey congratulations I've just turned on auto ISO so now the camera will control ISO for me when I'm shooting in manual mode it's, that's actually really nice so the next thing I want to set is what I what they're calling the maxative maximum sensitivity so you touch that and then you can scroll anywhere through here and choose your maximum right now I have mine set at 800 that's the highest that I want the ISO, ISO to go now I know that's not really like considered high ISO I personally don't like shooting high ISO images I like to get images of birds up really really close where you can see a lot of feather detail and in my experience high ISO tends to ruin that feather detail especially when you try to go and reduce noise later um, it's not always a problem and if you have to shoot at high ISOs then you have to there's nothing you can do about it I just prefer not to so I've set the highest ISO range on my D850 to be 800 sometimes I'll go in and change it if I have like a cloudy day or it's too early in the morning I might go as high as 2000 but very 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 seldom do I like to do that so I've just set up auto ISO with a range of 64 at the lowest and 800 at the highest so the camera will then choose an ISO between there according to what it thinks is good for the exposure of the image so we're done with the ISO I'm gonna set my white balance and I like this auto natural light auto it's uh to me it's a new feature I didn't see this on my d500 so to me it's new on the d850 
and it does very, very well with natural light. And that's where I'm always out shooting. I'm always out shooting outside in natural light. So I want natural light auto and it's worked pretty much every time I've used it. All right, so the next setting I'm gonna set is the set picture control. So you touch that, whoop. And then I choose vivid, whoop. So I've set my picture control to vivid. Now let me explain this, this is, this is kind of strange. Picture control actually has no impact on your RAW files and I'm shooting in RAW. So why am I choosing a, a picture profile if it has no impact on the actual image? When you choose a picture profile like this, uh, this Vivid, it actually writes a JPEG preview inside the RAW file. And when you hit you know, play on the back here to see your pictures, it's actually rendering that JPEG preview that's inside the RAW file, not the actual RAW file. And I've chosen Vivid, and I've made some, some changes to the actual Vivid profile, and I'll show you those in a second. But I've chosen those because they look, to my eye, the best or the closest to how everything was when I saw it out there. And it also kind of mimics or comes close to my processing style when I do post-processing. So it kind of gives me a little bit of a goal or something to look at so I know what the image looked like when I was out there. So here's the settings that I have changed on Vivid. So to do this, you, you touch Vivid and then you touch this adjust button down here. And then you can see all of the values that I have. So for sharpening, I have it on six. For clarity, I have it on one. Contrast is zero, brightness is zero, saturation is plus one, and hue is zero. This is, again, this is just a personal preference, but I found that these settings render those JPEG previews in a way that is good to my eye, and I like that. All right, I'm gonna make some more changes into this photo shooting menu. And let's see, I'm gonna move over and then I'm gonna move down so I go down to the next screen. And I'm gonna turn all of these things off. Active delighting, long exposure noise reduction, high ISO noise reduction, vignette control, auto distortion control, multiple exposure. I turn all of this stuff off for birding, wildlife stuff. Like if you were doing some long exposure stuff, I might turn on long exposure noise reduction or if I was doing some shots that I was shooting at a really high ISO, I might turn on this high ISO noise reduction, but 90% of the time I'm out there chasing animals and birds and stuff, so I turn all of these off. All right, so let's make some changes to the custom setting menu. This is where you can do some really cool stuff. So the first place I'm gonna go is this A autofocus. So I'm just gonna touch that, and then I'm gonna go right to here where it's highlighted already, A3, Focus tracking with lock on. And you're going to see two things. You're going to see blocked shot AF response and subject motion. So first of all, what is blocked shot AF response? So this actually controls the speed at which the D850 changes focus. For instance, if you're photographing a bird as it's flying through the sky and there's a tree and the bird flies behind the tree, do you want the D850 to focus on the bird, to keep focus on the bird, or to move and change focus to the tree. Well, in most cases, you would want it to keep locked focus on the bird, not the tree. So that's what this setting adjusts. If you look, you have really five settings. You have quick and delayed, and then a number value between one and five. And you can just touch these values to change them. Boop, 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 boop. So, I go usually with a default of four. This usually will keep a locked focus on a bird. And if it flies behind a tree, it will ignore the tree and continue to focus on the bird. It's also helpful if a bird is coming straight out of the sky and like hitting the water or some poor unfortunate creature on the ground. Because a lot of times when the bird gets down to the horizon, the camera will get confused and try to focus on the, on the horizon or maybe some grass or trees down here. So keeping it on four will help prevent that. In some cases, extreme cases, I'll even go as slow as five, but I've noticed that by using five or delayed, it actually seems to make the autofocus system unresponsive at times. Like for instance, if there's a bird up in the sky and I'm trying to get grab and nail focus on that bird, it won't switch really fast to the bird from the sky because I'm essentially telling it not to. I'm telling it to delay that. 
So a happy medium is three. That's a balance of somewhere right in the middle. It might jump focus to something else, it might not. I like to have it right about on four. And believe it or not, I make changes to this setting all the time depending on what's going on. And I'll show you a way to do that really fast here in a little bit. So if a setting of say four or five makes the focus system slow, when would a fast setting of say one or two actually be beneficial? Well, it's actually really beneficial if you're photographing say like a little small bird, like a warbler, and that bird is tucked away into the brush and you have all these sticks and tree limbs and leaves that you kind of have to try to focus through. If you had it on delayed or slow, the camera would almost always lock focus on one of those branches and never kind of go through the branches quickly to this little bird in the back. If you put it on one or quick, it will start to ignore those branches and jump around and actually go through and focus on the bird in the background really quickly. But just remember that when that bird moves, if it moves behind a branch, the camera is going to then change focus really quick to the branch. So when it comes back out, you're going to have to kind of reposition your focus point and keep it on that bird and hope that the focus changes again. So once you've made your selection, you have to actually hit this OK button for it to save it. So I'm going to go back to my default of four and hit OK. But now I'm going to talk about this subject motion. You have erratic or steady. There's this middle ground, which it's on by default, and 98% of the time, that's where I keep it, and it's performed wonderfully. But what that is, is if your subject is has an erratic movement, it's not you know easily determined that it's just going like this. Suppose it's going this way, and then it suddenly changes directions, or it's going straight out of the sky and then stops at the ground. That would then become erratic, so you would want to move this over to a, more of the erratic setting. But like I said, most of the times I keep it on steady. There's very few times when I want it on erratic. Maybe if I'm photographing an osprey or an eagle and they're actually making impact with the water and stopping, I'll put it on erratic and it helps keep the focus and prevent the focus from moving because the focus is trying to interpret where the bird is gonna be and it tries to be there for you. And if it's on erratic, it knows that, that it might have to change direction really quick. All right, I'm gonna make one more change to the focus system. And that change is pretty drastic. I'm going to remove the focus system being activated from the shutter button up here on the front, the shutter release. So by default, when you get the camera, the shutter release at a half press will initiate the focus system. I'm going to turn that off. This is what's known as back button autofocus. We'll be using a, a, actually a couple of different buttons to initiate that focus system. And here's how you turn that off. You come down here to this a8 AF activation and you want it to say AF on only and you want enable and that is now disabled the focus system from the shutter button on the back. So right now the camera actually wouldn't focus if you went to use this but I'm going to set it to a couple of buttons here in a minute and show you why and how you would use that. All right now we're going to assign some custom controls to all of the various buttons on the camera and I just told you we we're going to we deactivated the focus. I'm going to show you how to put it on a couple of buttons. And to do that, we have to come down here and touch F controls. And then we have to touch custom control assignment. And you get this cool little handy visual representation of the camera. And it's telling you which button is which. So this PV button, it's saying is located here on the front of the camera. I'm going to rotate my camera and show you. The PV button is right here. So I'm going to assign something to this PV button. And to do that, it's really simple. You touch the PV little icon right here. And I'm going to actually turn on the focus system and then activate an actual focus mode. So this is what I want. I want this AF area mode plus AF on. I'm going to touch that. And I'm going to assign single point autofocus to this button. So boom. Now the PV button will actually initiate single point autofocus. And you can use this in two ways. You can just touch the button once if you want to lock focus on like maybe a somewhat static subject that's not moving forwards or backwards, and you're not moving forwards or backwards either. You can lock focus on that one spot and then fire away with the shutter button and it won't constantly try to reacquire focus. 
So this is also, this is known as back button autofocus, even though it's on a front button. So maybe this is front button autofocus. I don't know. Um, so suppose whatever it is you're wanting to photograph is moving and it's moving quickly. Um, you would continue to hold down that PV button and that initiates the continuous autofocus. So then the camera, wherever the focus point is being single point here, then the single point uh, focus point will continually track whatever is moving. So for something that's moving, you want to hold that button in. And for something that's static, that's not moving forwards or backwards, you just touch it once to lock the focus. And it's actually really, really easy. I'm going to take the camera off of this tripod real quick, just to show you. Maybe. Yeah. So normally if I'm shooting, I hold the entire camera like this. So my middle finger is right here on this button already. So it's really simple to just tap this button without even looking or to even hold it in. And then I activate the shutter by holding the shutter button down. It's pretty cool. So now I'm going to set up the FN1 button right here. I'm going to back up so you can see where it is on the camera. It's telling you it's right here on the front of the camera on the bottom. I'm going to turn the camera and show you where it actually is. The FN1 button is right here. And I can easily reach that button with my ring finger. As I'm holding the camera, I use this finger, my ring finger. And I'm going to set an alternate metering mode to that button. To do that, I just touch the little display on the back here where it says FN1. And I cycle through all of the choices till I find the alternate metering mode that I want. And I want to set spot metering to that button. And what spot metering does is it tries to prioritize your exposure wherever your focus point is. So this is really beneficial when uh, matrix metering isn't working for you and maybe matrix metering is exposing for the sky and your bird is being underexposed. You can use spot metering and put it on the bird and the camera will prioritize exposure for the bird in that little spot wherever the focus point is. And here's what's interesting about it. Just touching this button once that we've assigned it to, this FN button, doesn't activate it. You have to hold the button in in order for the uh, alternate metering mode to be active. So if I want to shoot in spot metering mode, I have to actually hold that FN button in and then I can see in the display in the back that it's changed this metering mode and I'm now using spot metering. I take my finger off, I'm back to matrix metering. I want to be back at spot, I hold that button in again. It's actually really powerful and really helpful. So I'm just moving right down the list here and not really any kind of specific order. So the next button I'm going to set up is this FN2 and it's over here and I'm gonna just move down here and then touch the FN2 and I want to set that to my menu and my menu is actually a really cool feature my menu is a custom customizable menu that you can make for things that might be buried within the menu system you can put them at the touch of a finger really quick like so things like your blocked shot response instead of having to go through four or five menus to get to it, you can assign it to this My Menu where you can instantly get it. It's things like Auto ISO, you can set into My Menu so that you can instantly turn it off without having to go deep within the menu system. And I'll explain that in a little bit. All right, the next one is AF On. That's this button back here. This was the button or is the button that many people use and they refer to as Back Button Focus because we're gonna use this button right here to focus um, and I'm going to set it up with, by touching just right here, I'm going to set it up with AF mode plus, AF area mode plus AF on. And I'm going to do dynamic AF 25 points. So much like the PV button, I now have a focus uh, area assigned to the AF button. And this focus area also activates the focus system. So... Just like I said before with the PV button, if it's a somewhat static subject, you just touch this button once and it locks focus. And as long as you don't move forwards or backwards or your subject isn't moving forwards or backwards, you're good to go. You can just fire away. I've, uh, I use this on a red-shouldered hawk and I got some really cool pictures. I locked focus on his eye and he was just sitting there, but then he did this crazy shake and shook his feathers all over the place and it stayed perfectly in focus without having to reacquire focus the whole time. It was really, really powerful. So another interesting thing to note is why did I choose D25? 
I've experimented with all of the uh, focus areas on the D850 and for me D25 has the best balance of accuracy and ease of use. Um, if I can, I always try to use single point, but putting a single tiny point, it's, it's like this big in your viewfinder, it's, it's very small, on a moving bird and trying to keep it on the bird's face as the bird is flying is very, very difficult. It can be done, but it's challenging, and especially if you're doing some heavy lenses that are handheld, it's, it's hard to, to follow them and keep them on there. So with D25, you have a bigger area to keep on the bird. Now, the, the downside to D25 is it's dynamic and the camera will pick one of the focus points surrounding um, the area that you're in, and it might not always be the right focus points. For instance, if the bird turns sideways, the D25 might nail focus on the bird's wingtip, but miss focus on the bird's face. If you set your aperture accordingly to give you a wide enough depth of field, this isn't an issue. And I actually sat in my room one night and I experimented with all of the different uh, focus areas. I, I experimented with D9, with D25, with larger, and D25, like I said, gave me the best balance. It's, it's faster, it responds faster because there's a bigger area, and I, I can live with it being off focus a little bit as long as I set my aperture accordingly and, and know this at all times. So D25, I, you lose a little bit of accuracy on exactly where the focus is, but you gain focus speed and ease as you're tracking the bird. Whereas if you want the total complete accuracy, I would suggest single point, which I've assigned to this PV button in the front. Earlier, I talked about assigning the My Menu to this FN2 button, which I've done. And I've gone ahead and cleared out all of my selections so I can show you how to actually add something to it. So you just touch this FN2. And if you come here at the screen, you see you have the option to add items. So you want to touch that. And then I want to go into the photo shooting menu um, because that's the first place I'm going to grab my first thing I'm going to put in this my menu. And I'm doing this in order of least importance first because it will put this one in and then the next item I choose will be on top of it. You can resort them if you want, but I found this is easier. So I'm going to go to photo shooting menu. I'm going to scroll through until I find ISO sensitivity settings and I want auto ISO sensitivity control and then it's, it's basically telling me to choose a position and there's no other position but this so I'm good with that I'm going to touch it one more time and now it's saved so now I have auto ISO sensitivity control set under my menu so watch how this would work so say I'm out shooting and I notice that I want to turn off auto ISO. I come down here to FN2 and I touch auto ISO and then I touch off. And auto ISO is now off. So I'll show you one more time. I'm out shooting and I'm going to turn auto ISO on. I touch this, I touch this, and I'm done. Auto ISO is now on. That's kind of the benefit of putting items within this menu. You choose things that are really hard to get to and you can put them right at your fingertips and access them really quickly. Now let's add something else to this menu because it's something else that I access quite frequently. So I'm gonna click on this add items and I'm gonna go into the custom setting menu and I'm gonna click autofocus and I'm gonna do A3 focus tracking with lock on and I want that so I'm gonna touch it one more time and it's saved. So now I have two items in my my menu and I talked about this already and how I change the blocked, uh, blocked shot focus response. Suppose I've been tracking a bird and I notice that the, the tracking is too fast or too slow and I want to change it. I come over here and press this FN2 button and when the menu loads up, I touch the focus tracking with lock on and I change it to quick and I hit OK and I'm done. If I wanted to change it again, I just touch this and I touch that and I'm done. So it's much faster than say this way you'd have to be in the menu you have to navigate up uh, to here to here and now you can do it right but instead let's back up i'll show you one more time how much faster it is I'm shut off the menu say i want to change it really quick i press this fn2 touch that and i'm right there i can make my changes i hit okay and i'm done it's a mere couple of seconds 
So you can experiment with this My Menu section. You can put it on another button if you want, and you can add other things to it if you want. For me, in photography, I add those two things, and for video, I add some more settings. Um, I'll make, if anyone's interested, I'll make another video later on how to use the D850 for video. It uh, does slow motion video, and it's turning out to be one of my favorite things because I can handhold my 200 to 500 and get slow motion video right on the fly, and it's not really jerky because the slow motion doesn't exaggerate the movement. It's actually really cool and really powerful. So now that I've just shown you how to populate the My Menu section and how to actually disable Auto ISO within that menu, I'm going to show you another way to disable Auto ISO and actually change the minimum ISO value. I don't know why you would ever really want to change that, but maybe you would. So I'm going to show you an, an alternate way uh, to do that. And that's the really cool thing about uh, the D850 and other Nikon cameras is there's always more than one way to do something. So that's always beneficial. So I'm going to turn on the back screen so we can see what we're doing. We got the info button. So if you're out there shooting and you really want to disable auto ISO, all you have to do is press this dedicated ISO button on the top and you'll see on the back screen what happens when I do that. You have two options. You have auto ISO sensitivity control and, and on and it's telling you the front dial will change that. And then you have um, ISO sensitivity, the value, and it's showing you the back button will change that. So if you're shooting and you wanted to disable auto ISO because you had it enabled, you can press in this ISO button and then simply turn the front dial one click and it will turn off auto ISO. Boop, and it's off. And the menu here on the back the screen will display that. So it's off. I've got this ISO button pressed in and I turn that front dial bloop, and now it's on. And then the rear dial, while I'm still holding this ISO button, would change my minimum ISO value that I've set on auto ISO. Again, I don't know why you would ever want to change that, but maybe there's a situation where you would. So that's just another way to quickly disable auto ISO. And you can see this also through the viewfinder because it gives you that little option um, I don't know if we'll see it in here or not. I'll try to bring it up. Yeah, you can see it down in there. It's trying to focus. All right, you can see it says auto ISO down in the bottom right. I turn the dial, it says off. I believe that's what it says. Anyway, so you can see it there too while you're looking through the viewfinder. Really helpful. So here's a cool little trick I learned from using uh, the D850, and this trick works on the D500 too. I like to shoot in manual mode where I have control over the shutter speed and the aperture, but I've turned on auto ISO. And the D850 and the D500 both have a feature called exposure compensation where you can lower or raise the exposure in very small increments. And by doing that, you're actually telling the camera to take control of something and change a value in order to lower or raise that exposure. And if I'm in manual mode where I control the aperture and the shutter speed, that leaves one thing to the camera to control, and that's the ISO. So if I have auto ISO enabled and I dial in some exposure compensation, the camera actually will change the ISO and only the ISO. And that's actually been really helpful for me because if I'm using the D850, down in the bottom right corner, I can see what the current ISO is. And if I see that maybe I'm shooting at one two thousandth of a second and F5.6 or F8 and the ISO is too high, I can actually change the ISO by just dialing in some exposure compensation and it will lower the ISO for me while I have auto ISO enabled. So that's a way to actually control the ISO even though you have auto ISO enabled and it's been very helpful for me, especially for really bright birds that are white or pink or orange that reflect a lot of light back because they will tend to be overexposed and you have to kind of underexpose the image. And to do that, I dial in some exposure compensation, which then actually lowers the ISO that the camera has already chosen to get me a lower exposure. And it's been extremely helpful to me. Um, I, I use it on a daily basis. If you made it this far, congratulations. You've made it to the end of the video. I know it was longer than my usual videos. I talked about a lot of stuff and I threw a lot of information out there. That's another reason I compiled all that information into an ebook um, that really covers everything I already talked about so that you can take it with you, you can read it at your leisure whenever you want, you know, you don't have to have internet, it's kind of helpful. Um, you can get it in the description below, there's a link, it's only five bucks, that's a great way to support me and the videos, plus you get all of this information that you can take around with you. And 
Don't forget to share this video. That's really important. If you found it useful and you know somebody else that might find it useful, share it, show them. Um, that's really helpful to me as well. And I really think, like to thank everybody for all the help they've given me, for following me, all the encouragement. It's great. I, I love getting up every morning and seeing the new comments and the new messages from everybody. It's so cool. Um, don't forget to click that thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. And as always, leave comments. I love looking through them all. And until next time, I'll see you later.